Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Our guest today is Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey, Vice Chair of the Democratic Governors Association, who will assume the chairmanship in 2020. New Jersey became the latest state to raise incrementally its hourly minimum wage to $15 after the governor signed into law a measure phasing into action that higher rate over five years. For far too long, too many of our fellow citizens have been struggling to survive on wages that have not kept up with the cost of living, Governor Murphy said. He's touting an upbeat, optimistic, always pro-growth, progressive agenda advocating fairer taxation, criminal justice reform, and clean energy. Environmental stewardship, Governor, a pleasure to see you. Great to be here, Alexander. How are you messaging and enacting that forward-looking, progressive, pro-growth agenda. Uh, what's top of mind for you right now? First of all, it's great to be here. Great um, to have you. It is far more than words, although we, we have captured it in, in some of those words you've just uttered. Pro-growth, progressive, I'll take that. Um, I also uh, believe and say often you can't make economic progress without social progress, and likewise you can't make social progress without economic progress. We also talk a lot about a stronger and fairer state that works for everybody. So if you step back, I've been in office now a year and a few months. We inherited a state that was neither strong nor fair. So New Jersey was one of the few American states that didn't participate in the recovery from the Great Recession of a decade ago. And if that weren't enough, uh, it was a state, which is extraordinary given how progressive and its reputation is, it's a state that had allowed huge inequities to develop over time. So the haves, have nots, the us, them, particularly along racial and gender lines was stark in our state, almost unlike any other. So I'm not a believer, you know, Mario Cuomo had this great line, you campaign in poetry, you govern in prose. I think he had it right. Our prose is, to use that analogy, is one sentence, one paragraph at a time. There's no single magic wand. Uh, there's a series of steps um, incrementally that get you growing again and get you fair again. And we're on that journey. You came out of the gate not messing around. Yeah, we don't you know, mess around. I, right. I mean, authentically progressive in your commitments and wanting to deliver that economic justice yeah. for your um, state. Um, has the obstacle been um, in, in what you haven't achieved, that you still want to achieve, um, that the party, the Democratic Party, is not situated enough to advance genuine progressive solutions? I'd say yes and no. Uh, for the, we, we've gotten a lot done. I've signed over 200 bills, uh, and some of them are landmark best in the nation. Uh, you mentioned minimum wage. Uh, which I'm incredibly proud of, equal pay for equal work, earned sick leave, paid family, um, individual retirement accounts uh, f for folks who work in firms that don't get that otherwise provided. So a big agenda around workforce productivity and confidence security. Um, there are a couple of big ones we haven't quite gotten yet, 
and I haven't given up. So one is that we want to legalize adult use marijuana overwhelmingly because of the social justice reasons. We have the widest, I mentioned the inequities, we have the widest white, non-white gap of persons incarcerated in America. And the overwhelmingly biggest contributor to that is low-end drug offense. I want to get, we got partially a millionaire's tax last year. I'd like to get a real millionaire's tax. Not because I'm out to soak people. That's not it at all. I'm not a class warrior guy. I'm not a divide us versus them. The fact of the matter is New Jersey's a quintessential middle class state. Uh, the last administration in my state had ignored it. Some would say ravaged it. We're making a historic all all-time investment in the middle class, I can't justify making the middle class continue to take it on the chin and pay for that investment. So tax equity is part of that. But there isn't a long, I have to say, there's not a lot beyond that that we haven't been able to work together. So we are the big tent Democrats, as we are everywhere, and no, no more so than in New, New, in New Jersey. We've got lots of different uh, uh, elements of our party. But at the end of the day, I'm confident that we can uh, accomplish all that we've set out to. How has the national political climate, uh, specifically this administration and its budgets to date, how has that affected your job? They've hurt us. They've hurt us badly. And it's not just New Jersey. In some cases, they've hurt all American states. In other cases, they've hurt states that look like us. So you start off and say, okay, what is New Jersey? Uh, fourth smallest state geographically, uh, 11th largest population, meaning we're the densest state in America by far, by many measures the most diverse state in America, one of the most extraordinary shorelines anywhere in our country or the world. I could go on, I'll stop there for a moment. So you look at what the Trump administration has done. People ask me all the time, what's your biggest surprise as governor? It's the amount of time I've had to deal far and away the biggest surprise, we've, we, the energy and time we've had to put in pushing back on a lot of stuff that's come at us. I use my three verbs, mitigate, compensate, litigate. Um, and so it's hurt. So whether that's tax policy, you know, we're a good value for money state. We've never been a low cost state to live in. Uh, folks say, listen, I'm prepared to pay a premium as long as it's fair in New Jersey because I get a rich basket of stuff back. So limiting the state local tax deduction hurts us all the ICE raids in, in the most diverse, you know, splitting up families like they, they do for no other reason uh, other than their status. Uh, that hurts us deeply given our diversity. Uh, you know, wanting to drill for oil and gas off the Jersey Shore, uh, no way, no how. Uh, all sorts of other environmental steps that are, that are contrary to our interests. So it's a big deal. We've had to battle that consistently and we continue to. It strikes me, Governor, that there would be no more important message as we anticipate the 2020 election than for the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party to um, stake out every decrepit yep. bridge, tunnel, school building and say that you said you were going to rebuild America. That was a fraud. They may talk a good game on infrastructure. Uh, we're the party that actually does it and that we're doing that right now in New Jersey. But we can't do it all alone. We need, we need the federal government to be with us. And so far on the biggest project, which you, you and your viewers are all well aware of, is the Gateway Project, which is a new tunnel under the Hudson River. And for folks who may not know it, the, the two tunnels that are under the river right now are fine, but they were built in 1910. Uh, and so that's, this is, as I say, this is Roosevelt era. Theodore Roosevelt. Um, we desperately need, need that, th those new tunnels. 20% of the nation's economy relies on the Northeast rail lines. So the, 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 the rationale is overwhelmingly compelling, and I'm frustrated as heck, but I'm still optimistic we'll get there. We use our congressional delegation actively. We work very well together, as well as with Governor Cuomo and his administration and delegation. But your point is the right one. I mean, the infrastructure investment opportunity to create jobs, not just to fix the bridges and build the tunnels, but to create thousands of good paying union jobs that the rationale is overwhelming. In fact, it's the one element of Trump's campaign for president and his promises that made in, in transition that I was on record as saying it's the one area where I think we can find common ground. Um, and so far, at least, it's a lot of talk 
The talk is in the right direction, but there's nothing, there's no action, there's nothing that backs it up. So we're chipping away at this, getting that tunnel built, getting the pieces of that tunnel is priority number one in our relationship with the federal government. I'm an eternal optimist, a, frust a frustrated optimist, uh, but I believe we get there and I love your point. We are the party of infrastructure and we can prove that. As governor, are you capable of deploying a WPA style project in the absence of federal authority? To a certain extent. We have a transportation trust fund which is funded by gasoline tax. We just uh, recently announced $161 million of local municipal infrastructure aid, and that's real jobs and that's real investment. That's a lot of road repairs and a lot of local projects that have, have been wanting for years. In our state budget, we've put in 400 and something million dollars into NJ Transit. Now, that's, a, that's an important, that's not just of passing interest, it's of existential importance to us. When you're the densest state in the nation, moving people around, rails, buses, roads, tunnels, bridges, is not optional. It's, 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 a, it's as I say, existential. Well, if anyone's so concerned as you can. about the Green New Deal, uh, then just look at Sandy and, and the havoc 100%. caused by Sandy. Yep. Um, looking at the congressional efforts, uh, the Select Committee on Climate, um, from your perspective, how can you make the argument for the Green New Deal, or whatever you want to call it, how can you make it better? So we have, again, my nose is pressed overwhelmingly against the Jersey glass. So I observe the national discussions. Uh, I certainly learn from them, good or bad. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm the chair-elect of the Democratic Governors Association, so that, that all matters. But as it relates to the policies we put in place, I'm, I'm all in, uh, sure. in, in deep into the New Jersey reality. So we've got our own clean energy agenda, 100% commitment by mid-century. Um, in fact, right after this taping, I'm going to make a, uh, a, a remarks at the large annual offshore wind energy gathering. Uh, we have unusually strong potential in offshore wind. Uh, New Jersey's situated uh, it, uh, almost ideally uh, in the sense also not just on our shore, but the shelf under the water and the way it, it levels off for enough miles to allow us to put these windmills reasonably and economically uh, in place. We've got an objective of a minimum of 3,500 megawatts. Uh, we've got a big solar and community solar uh, uh, agenda. Environmental justice uh, is a big piece of this. So let's not leave behind a place like Newark that has four times the asthma, child asthma rate of, of our state or our country because of all the traffic and truck traffic at our ports. So we're, we're tackling it from all over. And, and by the way, again, it's, I inherited an, uh, an ugly reality. Right. You know, you, gotta, you can't do, New Jersey can't do all this on its own. So the regional greenhouse gas initiative collection of states is important to us. Signing that Paris Climate Accord adherence that I signed instantly is great that New Jersey does it, but we need everybody to do it. Hopefully one day soon, the federal government. The minimum wage can be a stopgap measure over time incrementally, we hope that it's an enduring measure of economic safety, security, and justice. But the tax reform that um, what is honestly now tax season has come upon Amen. us, tax fraud, not tax reform, yeah. um, has been clear as day that, that they pulled a fast one. You bet. Um, it, does it require that there's a Democratic president in 2021 in order for you and your fellow governors at the DGA to say we we need systemic and systematic yeah. reform. Yeah. It's it's hard to answer that question otherwise other than yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because this administration has proven and by the way the Republican controlled houses of Congress have proven that they have little to no interest in the middle class uh, period. And they say the, the rhetoric is great this would be a windfall and whatnot. P folks are, folks, first of all, didn't see the, the benefit in their paycheck. They're now doing their, it's tax season. Yeah. They're now doing their taxes and their refunds are either down or they're paying, whereas last year they were getting a refund. Um, the overwhelming percentage of the benefits, as you know, and you've talked about, go to the, one, the wealthiest 1% in our country. And again, I'm not a class warrior, but come on, man, the middle, this is a middle class country, New Jersey's the quintessential middle class 
state. That's the way we used to be. And by the way, from both sides of the aisle, historically, you, you had a lot of good evidence that we believed in that and our policies reflected that. This current administration uh, does not believe in the middle class in this country. Uh, they talk a good game, but their actions belie their, their words. They do not believe in our middle class. Uh, and therefore, I cannot see a scenario, not only uh, where this administration will come around in, in the absence of a Democratic president, but it adds to the imperative that we keep winning state houses because governors have never mattered more, that we, that we hold our leadership in the House and that we win the Senate back. Because if we're going to undo that awful tax law from December 2017, we're going to need not just a new president, a Democrat, certainly, but also leadership in both of those chambers and advocates in the state houses around the country. How do you get there? I know you've endorsed Senator Booker. We, I have. I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of Senator Booker's. We've known Corey a long time since he was a Newark councilman. I think he's got an extraordinary package of life story and experiences. His personal life story is extraordinary. But a councilman, a mayor, a senator, Somebody who's found a way, by the way, to work across both sides of the aisle. The one piece of the darn tax law that's so bad, uh, Opportunity Zones, was brought to you by Senators Booker and Scott. Uh, that's a great thing for New Jersey. Um, he spearheaded criminal justice reform uh, at the national level. Again, worked on both sides of the aisle. I'm a huge fan and a huge believer. But I would also say I, I think we've got a great field filled with a lot of talent and a lot of potential. We will win the White House. We must win the White House. You also are close with Mayor Pete and Vice President Biden. Very much, both of whom came in. Mayor Pete came in and spent a day campaigning with me. Vice President Biden threw himself all in a couple of times. Uh, so how do, they, and they, how do they stack up? I, I think mean, they're I, both they, great leaders. It occurs to me, Governor, that in order to get to 270 electoral votes, you need, it's a simple equation, personality plus geography equals destiny in American politics as long as the Electoral College is determining the outcome? Uh, the answer has to be yes. The geography, again, not to beat a, beat a dead horse, as they New say, Jersey. the geography I care about are the 21 <laughs> counties in New Jersey. Right. So right. Those, those, right. that's where I'm... My, yeah. My, my, but yeah, the answer has got to be yes. But I think you've got to stand for the right things. I think you've got to have a compelling story. I think you've got to convince folks that, um, that you've got an experience set that is... You know, you always look at what's the, what, what is needed and what do I bring to it and how closely... Does, does that match up? And you've mentioned three uh, guys, and there are other uh, men and women running for president who I would put in the same category who have all of that. You know, they, they say in baseball, five-tool athletes. You're talking about uh, we, we got a stable of five-tool potential presidents. I think that's a great thing. I'm not, one, I'm not of the opinion that, oh, my gosh, there's too many people running. Uh, frankly, President Trump proved uh, that he could slay 16 or 15 other Republicans, I think the, the broader the debate, the broader the diverse sets of views, the better it is for our party. And you see Indiana and Texas as potentially competitive in 2020. Well, Indiana was won by President Obama or Senator Obama in 08. He lost it in 2012. Um, I'm not sure Indiana, I, I, I'm not, again, yeah. I'm not following that, that closely. Texas is one. I'm the former national finance chair for the Democratic National Committee, and I did it alongside of our chair and a guy I, I believe uh, was one of our greatest chairs, Howard Dean. And I did it because Howard believed in the 50 state strategy to put us back as a party, back in business in places which have typically either been ignored or complete away games for our party. Right. Indiana and Texas are good examples of that. Uh, a lot of work was done by the DNC in 05, 06, 07 and 08 uh, in addition to an extraordinary candidate that allowed us to win that state. I don't think, you know, we're not quite there yet in Texas, but the demographics, the investment uh, by Chairman Perez and the party continues, the state party, it's coming our way. I'm not, I'm not smart enough to know whether it's competitive in 2020. I hope it is. If it is, it's a game changer. Uh, it's one of the top three states in terms of electoral votes. Um, that, that changes the whole game and the whole map. Governor, you're, you're one of the most insightful people when it, it comes to governing and considering the economic reality today because of your own story, um, because of your own experience. Um, it seems as though the Republican Party, which in effect was, was hijacked by those moneyed interests, the .0001% and dictated federal tax code based on that, 
now we're recognizing that some of those donors, some of those lobbyists, some of those in the wealthy cohort are recognizing, we're going to tilt off this planet. Uh, that's not to excuse or sympathize with the, the, the many years of a decaying tax code that was inequitable. But how do you talk to people uh, about the shift in the Democratic Party, um, whether it's Senator Booker or Mayor Pete or uh, Congressman O'Rourke, um, and the fact that we need to shift left as a function of the economic inequality, um, what was a safety net is now totally utterly destroyed. Yeah. You, you need more than a net. The first thing I'd say is I'm a proud Democrat. I always have been. Uh, so I grew up working poor, youngest of four, great tight knit family, but we were, you know, we were living paycheck to paycheck. A lot of loans to go to college and graduate school. I ended up working in business and, and ended up getting lucky and doing okay for myself. Um, while I'm a proud Democrat, I've never been, uh, I'm, for, uh, uh, I'm for this and I'm against you just because you're a Republican. And I ha my, my roots are in two states. One is Massachusetts where I was born and two is New Jersey where we've uh, raised our four children. Both states historically, by the way, have had a history of, uh, a track record rather, of electing moderate, fair-minded Republican governors in two of the most progressive states in America. Look at a Bill Weld or a Mitt Romney or now Charlie Baker, my high school classmate in Massachusetts. Uh, Tom Kane, one of my mentors in New Jersey. Christy Todd Whitman uh, to some extent as well. I think Christy campaigned as though he was going to be that governor and he, and he decidedly wasn't. And that's an important outlier. Yeah. I say that because on both sides of the aisle, I mentioned this earlier, there was sort of uh, an acknowledgement. We, we may have a different prescriptions but an acknowledgement that the middle class and those who were in poverty or those who were working poor and aspired to keep going up the rungs in life as a lifelong objective to get into the middle class, that we may have had different prescriptions, but we all kind of understood that was the American dream. That was the American story. And I think you've used the word, the Republican Party, particularly nationally, uh, has been hijacked. It's been hijacked by folks who may say the right things, but their actions belie those words. They don't care about the middle class. They don't care about investing in public education. They don't care about the environment. They really don't care about your health care. Uh, look at all that's been done uh, about uh, in and around the Affordable Care Act. And New Jersey has led the, the American class, by the way, in pushing back on that. Um, I'm of the opinion that Health care ought to be, you know, who says it's a privilege? Well, why, why is K through 12 education a right and health care not a right? I don't want to get tied up in the how do you get there, but let's just establish it ought to be a right. I was the U.S. ambassador in Germany. Germany has universal health care. Uh, it was brought to Germany by that crazy left wing liberal Bismarck. Uh, come on, this is not left right stuff. This is basic bread and butter. What do you. I'd also add that I think Germany, at least, and I believe Europe generally, has as many per capita billionaires as the United States have. And I, I'm a big believer in unlimited upsides. I think that's, the, that's a, a, an essential part of the American dream. But the Europeans are a lot more comfortable saying, you know what, we have to round some of the hard edges of capitalism. The, the price you pay for unlimited upside should not be unlimited downside. Uh, so the notion of safety nets that you talked about is a much more natural notion in Europe than it is in the United States. And that's not right. We should be better at that. In New Jersey, a lot of the steps we've taken is to we don't want to limit the upside. It's the American dream. Go for it. Risk everything you got. But but folks in our state, in our country, deserve to know that they've got some cushion, some net uh, under them. And, and we're, we've gotten awful uh, at that as a country, particularly under this president. That's what we're trying to create in our neck of the woods in New Jersey. Is the problem fixable if we do have an unlimited upside? Yeah, I believe it is. I believe it is. But unlimited upside shouldn't mean that it, your, your ref, reflex, every lever you pull is to cut taxes on corporations and the wealthiest. Uh, so let's get folks to pay their fair share. What about what has not been paid? The, the unfairness of what was never paid in terms of the systemically unfair tax code that has just been exacerbated and exacerbated. Yeah. Um, 
how do you retroactively deal with the problem? But, but listen, we've got, uh, let's look at it through the lens of wealth disparities. I don't know what it looks like in the country, but the wealth disparities across racial lines in New Jersey are jaw dropping. I'll give you a couple of statistics. The average net worth for a white family in New Jersey is $271,000. The average net worth for a Latino family is $7,100. And for an African-American family, $5,900. $271,000, $7,100, When I first read that, I, th I thought they had dropped to zero. And even then, it would have been a four or five multiple I thought uh, you did too. Right? It's yeah. extraordinary, but we haven't. And that it is exactly what it is. It's 40x. That's been building up. And to your point, what, how, do you, how do you clip back at that and meaningfully close those gaps that have been building up for not just decades, but for centuries? Go back to the dawn of slavery in our country. Um, and, and it's, it's, but are there any smart, quick fixes? You know, I, 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 this is an, I used to be on the national board of the NAACP, an organization that I've always, that I've been very close to in my adult life. And an idea that I liked then, and Senator Booker, we mentioned, is championing this, are baby bonds, uh, which I like that idea. Um, I'd like to have thought that New Jersey could have taken the settlements from the bank uh, misbehavior in the 2008 uh, Great Recession and have funneled those somehow intelligently toward the underserved communities where the wealth gap is the largest uh, or the widest, rather, under the theory that home ownership is a big factor in that. That's the biggest X factor between $271,000 and $5,900. Unfortunately, when I got there, all the money had been spent in, uh, in other programs and, frankly, in other places, New Jersey, uh, another area where we barely participated in it. So smart things like home ownership, affordable housing more generally. I like the baby bond idea. Um, I'm a big pub, national service guy, maybe in exchange for, uh, uh, for loan forgiveness, bold programs like that for young people, particularly those who have gone to either an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree and have incurred a lot of debt. Probably a series of steps. I don't know that there's one magic wand that shrinks those gaps overnight. In the seconds we have left, have you taken a public position on the wealth tax? I know you're probably in favor of, of the marginal tax returning to what I, I haven't taken a public position on the wealth tax. Um, I, the I, marginal, I, you think I, we I have, revert back to? I, I have believed that we need to raise uh, the tax on the wealthiest in our state, and that's what I'm and nationally. Uh, and nationally, certainly nationally. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm obviously, again, no, my nose is pressed against yes. the Jersey glass. So we, a real millionaire's tax is a central element of how we are going to fund education, health care, transportation for our middle class, working poor, and those in poverty. Governor, thank you for your time today. Great being here, man. Being thanks you. for having me. And thanks to you, too, in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming.